Stop the music. Stop the music. Stop the music. Emily, you have got to stop interrupting the Chris Ray podcast theme song. Mr. Corgan, I'm not Emily. This is Naomi. Oh, sorry. I just assumed since it's usually Emily who interrupts the theme song. I know. She taught me how. Oh, great. Now she's got the freshman doing it. Anyway, the reason I interrupted is because this podcast episode features the Social Justice and Activism Club. One of the leaders of that club, Tanaya, is a really good singer. So I thought it'd be fun if she sang the theme song today. You know, that's a great idea, Emily. I mean, Naomi. Okay. Tanaya, take it away. Podcast, the Crystal Ray Podcast, the Crystal Ray Podcast, coming in Podcast, the Crystal Ray Podcast, the Crystal Ray Podcast, oh boy, here we come. Thanks, Tanaya. What did I tell you? She's a good singer, isn't she? Anyway. As I already mentioned, this episode features the Social Justice and Activism Club. Social Justice and Activism Club is a club that creates a space to assist and advocate for under-acknowledged communities and issues. If you've never been to one of their meetings before, this is your lucky day. We recorded one of their recent meetings and present it to you today on the podcast. The topic, Injustices That Affect Indigenous Peoples. This meeting features podcast host Rebecca, as well as Rita, Lotus, Alam, Esmeralda, and of course, Tanaya. Here's Tanaya to start things off. Thank you for coming. And so today, we really thought it was important to discuss um, not only in honoring Indigenous history, but also discussing the land we inhabit. And so, yeah, let's get started. So in honoring um, Native Americans and the land that, um, well, obviously they were here before us and acknowledging that, um, we would like to acknowledge that the land that Christopher Ray Columbus High School occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. Specifically, this administration resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forest removal of the tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that have and continue to have the effect on the indigenous people of this land. And then if you don't know what a land acknowledgement is and um, its purpose is that it recognizes and respects the relationship that exists between indigenous people and their ancestral and contemporary territories. Additionally, a land acknowledgement provides opportunity to explore the current impact of colonization and systemic oppression on indigenous peoples. Land acknowledgements do not exist in past tense or historical context as colonialism is a current ongoing process. Um, so yeah, so furthermore, we'll, we'll be showing um, how they're still being affected and the history of Native Americans in the Americas. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And so now we want to have a brief overview of the five major tribes of Ohio, which are the Shawnee, the Miami, the Wyandotte, the Delaware, and the Ottawa tribes. For first up, we have um, Shawnee, which inhabit the uh, yellow portions of this Ohio map here. Um, The Shawnee, from 1600 to 1833, the Shawnee migrated from their homelands of South Carolina and Tennessee into eastern, oh, and by the way, this is Rita, (laughs) um, into the eastern Pennsylvania, by 1690. Then in 1720, they were forced further west by hostile tribes and Europeans. They began to move into the Upper West Ohio Valley. By 1750, they were established in the Scioto Valley in Southern and Central Ohio. Tecumseh, the Shawnee chief and warrior, warned about the advancement of white settlements and wanted a a stronger American Native Confederation. And um, this is a quote from him. He said, soon their broad roads will pass over the graves of their fathers and the place of their rest will be blotted out forever. The annihilation of our race is at hand unless we unite in one common cause against the common danger and thus escape the common fate. Your people too will soon be as falling leaves as in scattered clouds before your blighting breath. You too will be driven away from your native land and the ancient domains as leaves are driven before the wintry storms. Hey guys, it's your guy Icy here. Next week, we begin our celebration of Black History Month. And today I want to talk on on the topic of what does Black History Month means to me. 
So Black History Month initially is very, very, very important. It reminds me of the ancestors before us and what they had done for us to get to the place that we are today. It honors people like Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and so on and so forth. The list goes on and on and on. And it's really, really important to remember those because, yes, we have rights today. And, yes, we might have, um, you know, all the things that the ancestors before us didn't have. But if it was not for those like Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and Malcolm X, for what they did, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have all the rights that we have today. We would still be struggling. So it's really, really important that we take the time in this month of the whole year to remember those who has passed and to remember that everything that we have and never to and never to you know take granted for everything we have because like others before us like our ancestors they would have died to have the freedom that we have today so yes it's important to celebrate black history month it's important to honor those even the ones aren't known like um like Mansa Musa and so on and so forth like those who aren't really really talked about during black history month or those who has invented stuff we still we should still honor them in this month so to me that's what black history month means to me bye guys the next tribe we wanted to, to touch on is the miami tribe which is um located here in the red portions of this ohio map um originating in the area south of lake michigan the miami resided near present green bay wisconsin circa 1650. during some, the early 1700s they dwelled near present fort wayne indiana where the kai Ionga, their principal village, was located. They ceded their Indiana land by treated, treaties between 1818 and 1840. Among peoples known as the Great Lakes region, they occupy territory that is now identified as North Central Indiana, Southwest Pipicoa, Kalaktika, Menga Konkia, and Achakanguin. Sorry if I mispronounced this, I tried my best. Um, in 1730, they traded first with the English Shutterals for gunpowder, hatches, rum, blankets, and beads. And they have a main village in Ohio called Pickawalani, which has strongholds within the Miami and Miami River Valleys. Villages were destroyed by generals Josiah Harmer and Anthony Wayne from 1970, or from 1790 to 1794. And Little Turtle led a coalition of force of a thousand warriors that won um, near the Wabash River in Indiana on November 4th, um, 1791. For our next tribe, um, the, Delaware, uh, the Delaware, which is um, located here on the green portion of this Ohio map. Um, the Delaware were, were forced from New Jersey to, and, the Delaware, and Delaware because they were defeated by the Iroquois and crowded out, but the expanding English pushed them out. Um, Seven is, within 1758, the Treaty of Easton was signed, uh, which is a colloquial agreement between the British and the chiefs of 13 Native American nations representing the Iroquois, Lenape, and Shawnee. That was, it was signed and it helped the Delaware move to Ohio. Um, they occupied Eastern Ohio and Muskingum and Tuscarawas River counties. Um, they had um, a, war, a war chief named White Eyes that was a med mediator who negotiated the first native treaties with the United States and who worked towards his goal of a secure um, native territory. So then, <clears throat> this is Rodas, by the way, and now we will talk about the Adwa. They're also known as Adwa, it's spelled like O-D-A-W-A, -A, and they are the eloquent speaking tribe who originally lived on the East Coast and migrated into Michigan, Ohio, and Southern Canada. Their name is from the tribe is from the Indian word Adwi, meaning traders, because they had long been known as intertribal traders and barters. <clears throat> in 1740, they migrated to northwestern Ohio from Ontario in the upper Great Lakes. The Ottawa or Ottawa Canadian originally lived along the Ottawa River in eastern Ontario and western Quebec at the time of the European arrival in early 1600s. Their historic homeland, also known as Manitolian Island, is in Lake Curran in what is now Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The Pontiac Rebellion in 1763 was a campaign with the goal to surprise English garrisons and settlements and destroy them on the same day. But the fort on Sandusky Bay fell, but Detroit and Fort Pitt did not, and, and the campaign failed. And then for the Wyandotte, also known as the first Wyandotte, it means islanders or dwellers on a peninsula. Their villages were situated near present 
ancient Montreal, Canada, the French who called the wine Dante the Huron reached from circa 1536 when the tribe worked with the five nations of the Iroquois. In 1740s, they settled in northwest Ohio and spread east onto the Cuyahoga River Valley. They were pushed out by the Iroquois from Ontario and then settled in North Michigan, then migrated to Maumee in the Sadusky Valley. Tarhi generally supported peace between the white settlers and the American Indians, but he eventually led the Wyandotte into battle again at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. General Anthony Warne led the U.S. forces and defeated the American Indians. Tarhi supported making peace with the settlers and signed the Treaty of Grenville. Hi everyone, it's Koya. This is Sean here. And Jay Sean. Are you interested in science? Are you looking to join a club? Then why not join Science Club? A club, a club about, about science. science. Right after school this Wednesday, Science Club will be meeting in room 317 for a special activities run by science majors at OSU. Any questions, see Miss Ballman. Until, Until then, then, stay, stay science -y. Hello, this is Alam, and we'll talk a little bit about the Native American Heritage Month. So November is the Native American Heritage Month, or as it is commonly referred to, the American Indian and Alaska Native Heritage Month. The month is a time to celebrate rich and diverse cultures, traditions, and histories, and to acknowledge the important contributions of Native people. Heritage Month is also an opportune time to educate the general public about tribes, to raise a general awareness about the unique challenges Native people have faced, both historically and in the present, and the ways in which tribal citizens have worked to conquer their challenges. In 1990, Congress has passed and George, President George H.W. Bush signed into law a joint resolution designating the month of November as the first National American Indian Heritage Month, also known as Native American Indian Month. The Native Americans have made an essential and unique contribution to our nation and to the world. Introduced by Hawaii Senator Daniel Inoue, I'm sorry if that's pronounced incorrectly, and Congressional Delegate Enni Fallo and Mavega, again, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, American Samoa, the joint resolution stated that the president is authorized and requested to issue a proclamation calling upon federal, state, and local governments, interested groups and organizations, and the people of the United States to observe the month with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. In 2008, the commemorative language was amended to also include the contributions of Alaskan Natives each year by statute and or presidential proclamation. The month of November is recognized as Native National Native American Heritage Month. In 1993, Ben Nithros Campbell of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe became the third senator of Native American descent. Campbell grew in California, grew up in California, and moved to Colorado in 1978. He represented Colorado in the House of Representatives for six years before his election in the United States Senate in 1992. While in the Senate, Campbell was the first American Indian to chair in the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. Thank you. So now that we've um, had a brief overview of the five major tribes of Ohio, we want to talk about a couple of the cultures of some of the tribes, starting with Miami. The Miami is a Native American nation originally from southern northern Indiana and the adjacent parts of Illinois, Michigan, and Ohio, like we said before. Originally speaking one of the Algonquin languages, the Miami had the reputation of being a slow-spoken and polite with an inclination towards elaborate dress, especially among their chiefs. In the Miami language, the tribe's name for itself is Miamiya which means the downward people. The early Miami people were all culturally based and as well as being hunters and tattooing was common among the sexes. One of the beautiful parts of Native American culture and within Native Miami culture, which is called, which is powwows. Powwows are a gathering with, with dances held by many Native American and First Nation communities. Powwows today allow indigenous people to socialize, dance, sing, and honor their cultures. Powwows may be private or public, indoors or outdoors, and dancing events can, these dancing events can be com competitive with monetary prize. Well, that's um, a beautiful part of the Miami culture. And next in line to talk about the clothing that uh, Miami people um, would wear. And that Miami women would wear skirts with leggings and Miami men wear breech cloths. And the Miami did wear shirts in cold weather. Um, the Miami natives didn't wear long headdresses, but sometimes they wore beaded headbands with a few red feathers in it, like you see here in the picture um, next to the text. Um, the Miami um, Native Americans um, women would wear their hair long, um, sometimes braided or tied in a bun. 
Miami men usually shaved their heads in a mohawk style and wore a porcupine um, roach. And these roaches were made of porcupine hair, not their sharp quills. Um, Miami men and women both painted their faces for different occasions and also tattooed themselves with more prominent designs. Hey guys, Zuto here. Although you might hear my voice along with my co-hosts every week, there's a lot of work that you don't see or hear that goes into making each podcast episode. This work is done by our amazing behind-the-scenes crew who work tirelessly week after week to bring you Crystal Ray Podcasts as the highest quality possible. This team has seniors Carlos and Rodis, juniors Endy and Tiara, and now we are excited to announce that a new freshman student has joined the crew, Dorcas. This episode is the first episode Dorcas has helped edit. Welcome to the team, Dorcas. Thank you to the entire editing crew for always making us sound so good. We're now going to transition into the Shawnee tribe in Ohio. And so the Shawnee tribe is an Algonquian speaking Native American tribe whose original origins we don't know. However, but um, around 1600, they were living in the Ohio River Valley in the present day states of Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Indiana. And there is no similar narrative that describes Shawnee history or culture. Um, the nation has a complex history of migration and sovereignty. And the Shawnee people once lived in their ancestral homelands in the Middle Ohio Valley. Um, beginning around the 16th century, Shawnee people quickly adapted to encroaching European colonists. Um, so if travelers and um, Pro- prolific traders. Um, Shawnees were kind friends to many, but the equally fierce foes to some because, you know, if you're a colonizer and you come in a space where you're not wanted, then of course there'll be, you know, right, we be that way to be defensive. Um, warriors formed allegiances and fought battles to protect their nations as well as the um, Shawnee leaders also formed alliances with other tribal nations, of course, that still persists today. And although many lifeways like have changed um, from what they originally were, um, as true with all cultures, many Shawnee people practice traditions that have been passed down through the generations. Um, the community maintains inclusive engagement and a healthy dialogue to foster innovation and cultural um, perpetuation. And so, yeah, so the Shawnee tribe, they were uh, renowned as first warriors. And so other tribes would invite them to come share their lands in return for protection because they were known as first warriors. Um, this resulted in the Shawnee at various points in history, not just like any set point um, occupying lands as far as South Carolina and as far east as Pennsylvania and as far west as Missouri. So they were really widespread. And they also worshipped a great spirit as well as the spirits of nature and natural objects such as the mountains and animals. And you know, like a lot of Native tribes also kind of, their um, their beliefs also center around the idea of the great spirit. And they also worshipped um, a deity which they know like, which we know as um, our grandmother, they, who they believed was responsible for creation um, and for drawing souls up to heaven in a net, which is really cool. And so some worship um, also centered around what's called the Mishami, and which were sacred bundles of holy objects and each of the five sets um, kept its own mishami and they believed that manipulating and venerating objects in the mishami they could help bring good fortune and um, the, the mishami believed to be able to influence health um, our harvest to hunting to war and the only very important tribe members were um, privy to what objects were that the mishami actually contained so you wouldn't actually know what the mishami actually had unless you were um, someone who was very important or you were a tribe leader and so some basic livelihood that was that they practiced was a combination of farming hunting gathering um, and traditionally women farmed um, maize beans squash pumpkins and they gathered wild staples such as berries and nuts and the shawnee men they however they hunted throughout the year for um pheasants, beer, deer, and other animals, and the Shawnee, like other tribes, were very adept at finding uses for all parts of animals they hunted, so they would use, like, most parts, you know, the bones for weapons, the fur for um, clothing and things, and so here is just um, just a map of some Shawnee reservations that were kind of, kind of concentrated in the northwestern regions originally from 1850 to 1830. And so, yeah, that's um, where they were in their reservations. I would say definitely on your own time, if you can, try to explore the language um, that many tribes, even if Ohio, if it's easy to start in Ohio, or just um, tribes in other regions of the United States, because their languages, their languages are, are very beautiful and really cool to learn. So. Hey guys, it's Jade. Have you noticed all the flags hanging outside the cafeteria? 
Ever wonder what that's about? Here's Mr. Nash and Ms. Carrillo to explain. My name is Andre Nash Jr. I am the athletic director as well as our diversity, equity, and inclusion chair. As you can see on this flag wall here, we try to celebrate our diversity, but we also try to have representation of all of our the workers, of all the past and present students, parents, faculty, and staff. And we hope to add more flags as our community grows. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Carrillo. I am the spiritual life coordinator here at Chris Array, and uh, I'm also a first generation uh, American here in the US. Uh, my family came from Mexico, and uh, I love Chris Array, and I love everything about it because of the fact that growing up, uh, my school never had as much diversity. I was the diversity. And so because of that, it's amazing to see all of the very many cultures and backgrounds that we have here at Chris Array. I'm so glad that I get to work here. Not only do I get to teach everyone about my faith, but I also get to teach everyone about my culture. We are proud of the families, the students, faculty, and staff that come to Crystal Rain as a part of our group of family. And next, we're going to be talking about the how can we support indigenous people. Um, so this is Esmeralda, and I'm going to be talking about ways that we can support Indigenous people currently. We're going to have like two main things to focus on, which are like our core ways, which we can like, we can do all of these like day to day, but these are like more of the basic stuff that you can do if you don't have access to like transportation or if maybe you're like not financially stable enough to like go reach out and donate a bunch of money things like that and then we have like more elevated steps that really like i guess directly um hit home to a lot of these indigenous communities so first we have like donating clothes which like i said money donating which is like clothes money things like that it's always just like maybe if you have a shirt that you don't want donating to organizations and money, which can be a little iffy, especially because of COVID. We've definitely seen a struggle and like lack of jobs and things like that. Um, but with shopping and purchases, we can, if you do want to like direct specifically looking at stereotypes that we often perceive when we think of these Native American identities, I know we don't always have, like subconsciously, we're not always subconsciously aware that we're thinking of these stereotypes. Um, but most of the time, it's just um, acknowledging it because we've seen it in different types of representations, whether it be like um, movies. I know Western movies played a big impact on a lot of people, or like just how we've um, learned about these people in their community through media like Instagram, news outlets, things like that. And then really like hitting about um, like paying attention to the way that they self-identify their ancestry or like their um, indigenous identity and also making sure that we're not claiming we're indigenous when there's not like when there's a really distant and um, ancestor who was indigenous because for them it's not really about like dna it's more about like the experience and whether like you are um really interacting with a tribe or whether you're like really like in a way they that they claim you Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Emily and this coming Thursday is the last day teachers will accept work for progress reports and you will have access to them the following week. And one more thing, reminder, these are just reports to show how your grades are and remind you that you may need to improve them and nothing is wrong with a little improvement here or there. Calling out things that are, that are tr like taking this indigenous identity and then f like profiting off of it or like just claiming it when it's really not their place to. We see it a lot in like mascots or logos. I know like a lot of schools, especially like it could be in the Midwest or a little bit more out West. It is really common to see these um, high schools or elementary schools where they use a chief wearing 
a sacred headpiece and then that being their like mascot it really takes away from the importance of this leader and like the cultural significance of these this apparel and things like that and then like taking our like support one step further we can look at social media which is just really supporting indigenous creators we've seen a lot more like more people stepping up and being like hey indigenous people are struggling we want to acknowledge that this is their time for them to really step up and talk about what they're facing and what they see instead of us being like hey, this is what's going on because we want to support the source rather than speaking over them. So really incorporating and like the other, the third bullet point, including um, indigenous people in conversations, not just about social justice, but environmental, political, things like that. And in the political aspect, we can see like supporting indigenous people by support, rejecting policies that go directly against them and in this we can specifically see like stop line three has been a really big problem in indigenous communities because they're going through their territories that the government has kind of just been like hey this is for you and a lot of companies are not respecting that and they're taking their space that was given to them and really like diminishing them and pushing them aside and we can also take it a step further by calling your government officials you don't really have to be like give them an in-depth call you can just be like hey i call in tell them hey i want to make sure that you're considering these indigenous communities and what they face and we want to really make sure that they're being highlighted and Maybe you didn't elect them. If you can vote, go vote. But if like, you know people who can vote, make sure you're like, hey, please make sure that you're talking with your, like communicating with these in, with these communities and making sure that your representatives are paying attention and, make, and knowing that, hey, this is something that I care about. And I have the power to re-elect you to vote for a different person and my opinion matters and their opinion matters as well. Um, hey guys, it's Jay Sean again. And on January 9th, I had the pleasure to be able to see Governor Mike DeWine be inaugurated. And it was honestly a cool experience, you know, um, depending on what grade you are, you may have had a US history or you may have taken government. But hearing about some of the, um, just kind of, I want to say, things that set the foundation of our country, it was very interesting to see it being applied, like, right in front of me. Like, when I saw the governor um, swear on the Constitution, not only the U.S. Constitution, but the state Constitution, it was kind of just interesting to see because, you know, I've always, we've heard about it and we've learned about it, but seeing it actually be applied and talked about still modern day was a really cool experience and just really connecting to these communities directly not just like behind the sidelines i know it's a little difficult again covid really like disrupted a little bit of a lot of things but really just trying to make that effort and making that connection with these communities is really important in order for people to really like acknowledge hey this is happening, we need to help uplift these people so that they can get their voice out there. So beautifully said, Esmeralda. Um, everything that she said, claps to her. But we wanted to make sure that everyone that is in the meeting and is listening and also on the podcast listening gets takes away all of these different core ways and step further that we can do to support Indigenous people um, throughout the whole year. So we also wanted to kind of like show a brief, like kind of like a plug for our future meeting that will go into depth on the injustices that affect Native people, um, which will not be in this meeting, but just this is a different topics that we talk about that touch on different parts that Esmeralda was talking about. So we just wanted to let you guys know that this topic centering on Indigenous people and making sure that they're heard, represented, and um, donating and just having different ways to supporting them should continue on without outside of the month of November and that the whole year. But yeah, that is our SJA clubs meeting for today. Thank you guys for um, coming. We hope you guys learned um, a lot 
more about Indigenous people that you knew before. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. And we hope you can continue supporting Indigenous people and learning about Indigenous cultures within Ohio and the United, the whole United States. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. Uh, cast this was the